Pocahontas, Chapter 2. This is Part 5, and we are continuing our reading of Chapter 2, beginning at the top of page 41. But Captain Newport had given him swords, Powhatan said. He had put away his guns when asked. Why couldn't John do the same? After all, Powhatan was John's father. As his son and chief, John should do what his father wanted. John wished no further misunderstanding. Powhatan, he said, you must know, I honor but one king, and I live here not as your subject, but as your friend. No, not as a friend, Powhatan replied. Captain Smith, many do inform me, he said, your coming hither is not for trade, but to invade my people and possess my country. All the time that Powhatan had been talking, his warriors had been secretly gathering around his house, and now Powhatan made an excuse to leave the building, with his wives and children. Powhatan ran away, leaving behind several women to entertain John and keep him from becoming suspicious. But after a while, John did become suspicious. He had only 18 men on shore, who of course were far outnumbered by the natives. But, as it turned out, John didn't need his men. He surprised the warriors, who were secretly trying to block his exit, fired his pistol into the group, and at his first shot, they all fled. Pocahontas was one of the children whom Powhatan took with him on his flight. She would have seen the frightened warriors streaking into the woods to tell her father that his plot had failed. She would have watched her father try to smooth things over by sending John a pearl bracelet and chain and an apology for his absence. She also knew that there was already a new plot for doing away with John Smith. She wanted to warn John, but how could she? Yet when evening came, Pocahontas could not help herself. When no one was looking, she slipped away from her family and ran through the woods until she came to the place where the English were staying. She waited for a chance to speak to John alone. Go, she begged him, go quickly. Her words must have tumbled over each other, so great was her haste, so deep her worry. Her father's men were going to try to kill John, she told him, with his own weapons if they could. If not, some other way. Later they would send him food, she said. He should be careful. Oh, he should be very careful, for the food might be poisoned. John told her he, should be, he would be very careful, and he thanked her for coming. He wished he had some presents for her. Now, of all times, he would have liked to give her something pretty. But Pocahontas had not come for presents. Tears streaming down her face, she said she didn't want them and couldn't take them if she did. If her father saw that she had presents, he would know what she had done and he would kill her. Quickly, Pocahontas turned and ran back through the woods. An hour later, a procession of eight Indians brought the Englishmen huge platters of food. But John made the Indians taste every dish before he and his friends would take even a bite. All night John stayed on guard. All night the Indians looked for a chance to surprise him. But that chance never came. The next morning he left Werewokomoko, but before returning to Jamestown, he went in search of corn. Wherever he went, however, the Indians tried to kill him. On his visit to Powhatan's brother, Opechan Kano, warriors tried to lure John outside where they lay in ambush. But John was warned, and in sudden fury, he put his pistol on Opechan Kano's chests and grabbed him by the lock of hair, which, like a bird's crest, he wore in the Indian style on top of his head. Terrified, Opechan Kano and all his warriors surrendered their weapons. A man who could so brazenly insult a chief in the midst of his own people must have no fear for his life, the Indians reasoned. He must have secret magic. Yet later, when they found John taking a nap, they were ready to try again. But John woke up, snatched his sword, and the warriors decided it was no use. Indeed, there seemed to be no way to get rid of the man. The Indians tried to trap John on his way back to Jamestown, but they didn't succeed. They tried to poison him, but he threw up the poison. The rumor spread. John had secret magic and couldn't be killed. Pocahontas must have heard the rumor. Perhaps she believed. Perhaps she only hoped. When John returned to Jamestown, he found himself suddenly in sole charge of the settlement, the only surviving member of the council. 
In his absence, all the other members had been drowned when their skiff had turned over, which meant that John's word was the law. He had brought back corn and deer suet so that there was enough food in the storehouse to last until harvest if they were careful. And they would be careful. From now on, John said, no one would eat who didn't work. For three months the settlers did work, and they did eat. Then it wasn't the Indians who stopped them from eating. It was rats. English rats. There was no such thing as an American rat. They had come off English ships, settled down, multiplied, and invaded the storehouse. They had eaten all the corn that the English had been counting on, and it was only April. What were they to do? the settlers asked. Starve again? No, John Smith said. They were going to divide into small groups and live off the land just the way the Indians did when they ran short of food. Some would go down the river where there were plenty of oysters, some to Point Comfort where the fishing was good, some upriver near the falls, and some would stay with friendly Indians. The settlers didn't have much faith in the scheme, but they did eat just as John had said they would. In August, they were still surviving when a fleet of English ships came sailing up the river. The settlers ran to the river bank. What news? Three hundred new settlers, they were told, and a new governor appointed by the king, Lord Delaware. He was still in England. He wouldn't be able to come until later. A new charter, too. New rules for governing the colony. The ships tied up, and the newcomers tumbled off the ships. The most conspicuous passenger, however, was no newcomer. Captain Gabriel Archer was back, and would have enjoyed telling John the rest of the news. John Smith was out of a job. The colony was going to be run differently now. Where was the new charter, John asked? Well, it was on Captain Newport's flagship, but it wasn't here yet. There had been a storm at sea, and some of the ships had been blown off course. Who was the deputy governor, John asked, the man in charge until the governor came? Sir Thomas Gates. He was on the flagship, too. And the man next in command after Gates? Sir George Summers, also on the flagship. In that case, John declared, he was still in charge. His term as president did not run out until September 10th, and unless the flagship arrived before then, he would remain president until the end of his term. Stubbornly, John went about his work. Day after day went by, but still no flagship appeared. But four other ships came in, and Captain John Ratcliffe was on one of them. Both Archer and Ratcliffe back? How could there be anything but trouble ahead? Perhaps to get away from town, John decided to go upriver to check on the settlement there. But, as it turned out, this trip was a disaster, too. The settlers upriver were mad at him. The Indians were mad at the settlers, and the place was in danger of flooding. John did what he could, and then turned back toward Jamestown. Okay, we're going to pause here again. Uh, we have just a, sh a little bit more uh, with the final reading of chapter 2.